Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you have never seen my face on your screen before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week, so if you think that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And whilst you're at it, don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. But anyway, this week we are going to be talking about a serial killer case from Florida. A serial killer who was responsible for at least 10 murders but may have committed even more than that. In the early 1980s the dead bodies of young women started turning up in Tampa in Florida constantly at an alarming rate. Just as the police discovered one body another one was found and then another and another. It was a race against the clock to capture the person that was committing these brutal attacks. But but it wasn't until another victim of the killer that managed to actually survive and escape with her life came forward to the police and provided the breakthrough that they had been waiting for. Her story and her memories from the attack led them to the identity of the perpetrator. But quickly before we get into the case I would just like to say a huge thank you to Babbel for kindly sponsoring this section of the video. Babbel for those of you who don't know is a language learning app the best language learning app on the market, I think anyway, and so do many others because they have millions of active subscribers. There are honestly so many languages that you can learn on Babbel. A couple include Spanish, German, um, Italian, Portuguese, Russian, and also the one that I'm currently learning on there, which is French. Last time I worked with Babbel, I spoke about how it has always been one of my kind of life goals to be fluent in a language that isn't my first language. And Babbel is is really helping me get closer to achieving that every day. Babbel is proven to get you speaking a new language in just three weeks and my favourite thing about it is that they teach you the language in ways that are really fun so that you actually enjoy the process and journey of learning a whole new vocabulary. I also really love that the classes are quite short because it means that even if I've got a jam-packed day and I'm really really busy I can still squeeze in like a five ten minute lesson on Babbel and keep up with my learning. They'll teach you through reading, listening, writing and speaking tasks as well as through fun little games and podcasts and they also have this thing called Babbel Live where you can join online classes with expert teachers in small groups so you can learn alongside other people that are studying the same language that you are. The lessons and classes on Babbel are created by over 150 real language teachers and university studies have actually shown shown that 15 hours of learning on Babbel equals a whole semester or term of learning at college, which it's just mind-blowing, I think. Honestly, I think Babbel is amazing and I could not recommend their service enough. So if you would like to learn a new language yourself, then now is definitely the time to do it. Because if you click on the link in my description box, you can receive up to 65% off your Babbel subscription. Less than $5 a month to learn a new language. Again, a huge thank you to Babbel for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel. It really does mean so, so much. And now let's just get into the case. So for today's case, we are going back to the year 1984 in Tampa, which is a city in the Sunshine State of Florida in the US. It was the 13th of May 1984, which was actually Mother's Day, when two young boys were out playing together in a field not too far from their homes in the southeast area of Tampa. They were playing with these um, like parachutes that they had made using string and plastic bags, and they were having a really good time having fun. But then all of a sudden both of the boys noticed a very strong foul smell coming from somewhere in the field. Initially the boys thought that maybe this horrible horrible odour was a dead cow or another dead animal or something so they started just looking around the area and investigating. And soon after this they discovered the source of this awful smell however it was not a dead animal. 
animal it was actually the dead body of a young woman so the boys immediately contacted the sheriff's department and officers and detectives went straight to the scene and it was instantly obvious to the detectives just from looking at the body that this was not a natural death this woman had very clearly been murdered and tortured. She was discovered lying face down on the ground, she was naked and she was absolutely covered in bruises. She had also been bound with rope. She had rope around her hands which had been tied behind her back and she also had rope tied around her neck and this had been looped around a couple of times and this rope around her neck seemed like it had been used by whoever had done this to control the woman to pull her around and stop her from escaping almost like she was a dog like she had a dog collar on with a leash the victim had also been posed by the killer as i said she was found naked and her legs had been spread apart spread very far apart in fact so far that her hips had actually dislocated now the police did find some evidence at the crime scene or what they believed might have been evidence related to this case they found a little piece of cloth near the body that had been tied in a knot and they also discovered tire tracks in the dirt so believing that maybe these tire tracks had come from the vehicle that the killer had used to transport and dump the body the police decided to create a plastic cast of the tracks and they sent this cast to the fbi so that they could hopefully help determine what kind of vehicle had made them and in the meantime whilst they were waiting for the results from that the woman body was taken for a post-mortem which revealed that she had been dead in that field for about three days by the time she was found by those two young boys. The autopsy also concluded that she had been raped by her attacker so this crime was obviously sexually motivated and her cause of death was from asphyxiation. She had been strangled to death and on top of that she was also horrifically beaten. As I said she had bruises all over her her body where her attacker had just viciously abused her before her death. So now that they knew her cause of death the police had the task of identifying this poor woman and once they collected her fingerprints she was identified as being Nguyen Tai Long or Lana Long as she was also called by those that knew her personally. She was a 19 year old woman of Laotian descent and she hadn't been in Florida for too long actually. Lana used to live in LA but she moved to Florida fairly recently because she wanted to attend university there to study art and cinema. However, before she could do that, she needed to save some money to fund her education. And to do this, to save money, she started working as an exotic dancer at a bar called the Sly Fox Lounge. And as well as that, to make some extra money, she also started working as a sex worker on Nebraska Avenue in Tampa, which was like the red light district area where many other sex workers operated. Not too long after Lana was identified the results from the tire track cast had come back from the FBI and they said that they believed the tire that made these tracks was called a Vogue tire. That was the tread design. So this was useful evidence for the detectives. It meant that they knew what kind of tires to look for in this investigation. However another piece of evidence that they obtained that would go on to play a huge part in the case was discovered on a couple of items that were recovered from the scene. One of which was a scarf. There was a scarf at the scene that I believe belonged to the victim, Lana. And when this scarf was sent off for testing, scientists discovered very, very tiny red trilobal fibres that were found to have come from a red carpet. So the police believed that these tiny red carpet fibres had had probably come from the vehicle that the killer had used to transport and dump Lana's body, the vehicle that had made those tyre tracks. Again, this wasn't huge, huge evidence at this moment in time, kind of like the tyre tracks, but the detectives were hoping that it would become very useful when they eventually, hopefully, had a suspect in the investigation that they needed to match the evidence to. However, as the days went by, this murder inquiry was proving more and more difficult because they didn't have too much to really go on. They received very little leads and they didn't really have 
any people of interest in Lana's case. Lana did have a boyfriend, so they did suspect him to start with, but there was absolutely no evidence linking him to the crime, and so ultimately he was ruled out. The police just did not know who the killer was. They couldn't work out whether it was someone who knew Lana and the murder was personal or if she was killed by a complete stranger. However, then just two weeks after Lana's case, the detectives and residents of Tampa were stunned when a second body was found. On the 27th of May 1984, a man discovered the dead body of a female dumped on the side of a dirt road in another kind of rural area in Tampa and this body was located about 28 miles away from where Lana's body was found. This woman was also naked when she was discovered although her clothing was found just left around her body. She was lying on her back and it didn't seem like she had been there for very long and she hadn't been dead for very long because her body hadn't really begun the decomposition process yet and according to one source she was even slightly warm when she was found and one of the detectives that was at the scene actually said that although she was dead you could literally still see the terror and the fright on her face as a result of what she had endured. Similar to Lana this woman was also bound with rope, her hands had been tied behind her back and rope was also tied around her neck. Again it was like it had been used to control her and pull her around like she was an animal. When the body was taken for an autopsy it was found that she had also been raped However, her cause of death was slightly different to Lana's. So this woman had also been strangled, but as well as that, she had sustained some stab wounds. The killer had actually used a knife with a three inch blade to slash her throat. Following the discovery of her body, all of the evidence that was at the scene, so for example, the woman's clothing was collected and handed over to scientists. And on her clothing, the scientists picked up some tiny fibers tiny red carpet fibers and traces of these carpet fibers were also found on the victim's body there were some near her breast and also some tangled up in her hair and when compared it was found that these red carpet fibers were an exact match to the red carpet fibers that were collected from the scarf at Lana Long's crime scene the fibers were not just alike or similar they had come from the same carpet so after this realisation, the police were able to link these two cases together and in addition to that tire tracks that were found at the second crime scene also matched the tire tracks found at the first one so whoever killed Lana Long must have also killed this second woman and the detectives immediately feared that this was the beginning of a serial killer in Florida and they were right. Now even though this second victim wasn't decomposed at all when she was found the police were really struggling to figure out who she was and so they created a composite sketch of her face which was then released to the public and the media in the hopes that someone would recognize her and come forward and thankfully someone did. I'm not sure exactly who it was but someone got in contact with the police and said that they recognized the composite as being a woman named Michelle Denise Sims. She was 22 years old and she, like Lana, had not been in Florida for very long before she was murdered. Michelle was originally from California and she arrived in Tampa in Florida just a couple of days before her death. But the similarities didn't stop there because Michelle also worked as a sex worker. So two sex workers had been kidnapped and killed within just two weeks of each other. So now that the police had confirmation that these two cases were definitely connected, they decided to turn to the FBI again for help. They asked the FBI to come up with a psychological profile of the attacker and after looking into the cases FBI criminal profilers said that they believed the killer was a white male probably in his 20s. They theorized that he most likely
likely didn't go to college or university. He probably didn't have more than a high school education. They said that he probably, quote, doesn't handle relationships well and he probably doesn't like women very much. He had something against women, sex workers in particular, because he clearly enjoyed torturing them and humiliating them. It wasn't so much the actual death part that did it for this killer. What did it for him was causing as much pain to these women as possible. He would hit them and beat them and bound them and pull them around using rope that was wrapped around their necks like they were animals. It was also suggested that perhaps the vehicle he used to abduct the women and transport their bodies was a van because he probably would have needed the space. So that was the profile that the FBI came up with, what kind of man they believed was committing these horrific crimes. But unfortunately, despite having this profile, the police were still really struggling to identify the perpetrator. And as the weeks went by, the cases of Lana Long and Michelle Sims started to go cold. And it wasn't long before another body was found, just under a month after Michelle's murder, a third victim was discovered. It was the 24th of June when someone who worked in the local area came across the body of a female in an orange grove and they contacted the police. However, when the police arrived at the scene, they noticed that there were a couple of differences between this victim and how she was left and the first two victims. Although the woman had been raped, she was actually found fully clothed and she hadn't been bound with rope, nor did she have any rope around her neck like a ligature like the first two victims, although she had been strangled to death. So when the police found this body, they couldn't be sure that this was another victim of the offender that killed Lana and Michelle. Maybe this woman was killed by someone else. Now this body was pretty badly decomposed by the time it was discovered. It was clear that she had been dead for some time at least a couple of weeks so the police were concerned that identifying her was going to be difficult but eventually they found out that this was Elizabeth Loudenbeck and she was 22 years old and another difference between Elizabeth and the other two victims was that she didn't work as a sex worker she worked in a factory however she did go to Nebraska Avenue the red light district area of Tampa fairly often because she liked to go to the bars there. So if she was killed by the same man, then that's probably where he abducted her from, just like Lana and Michelle. Now, initially, Elizabeth's boyfriend was a person of interest in her murder inquiry, and so he was brought into the police station and he was interviewed and he was also asked to perform a polygraph test, so a lie detector test, which he agreed to. He was happy to do that. However, he failed this test. And so in the police's eyes, he was like the main suspect. They believed that he had murdered his girlfriend. But eventually he was completely ruled out as being the killer when scientists discovered red carpet fibers on Elizabeth's clothing. And these red carpet fibers were identical to the ones found on the first two victims. So Elizabeth was killed by the same man that took the lives of Lana Long and Michelle Sims. The police really did have a serial killer on their hands and they knew that it wouldn't be long before he struck again. On the 7th of October, 1984, the body of a fourth young woman was found just dumped by the entrance road of a ranch close to the Pasco Hillsborough county line in Florida. This victim was a young African-American girl and she was naked when she was found. However, her clothes were discovered at the scene just around her body. And I believe her bra was left hanging on the entrance gate of the ranch. And again, like the last victim, when this woman was found, the detectives weren't totally sure that she was even killed by the man that had killed the last three because there were a couple of differences between her murder and the previous murders.
years. This woman had also been raped, however her cause of death was different. She had been shot instead of strangled. She was shot in the neck with a gun and I believe she hadn't been bound with rope like the first two victims. After this woman's fingerprints were taken, she was identified as being 18 year old Chanel Williams. She was a sex worker who had only been released from prison not long before her murder and she had been sent to prison for her sex work. She was arrested for being a sex worker. However, when she was let out, she went straight back to it to sex work because she needed needed the money. And just like previous victims, she worked on the red light district in Nebraska Avenue. Chanel was last seen alive about six days before her body was found and the place she was last seen was Nebraska Avenue. She was seen there one evening by a friend of hers, another sex worker, and then shortly after this, she disappeared completely. And I'm sure you know what is coming next. Even though the police initially thought that maybe Chanel's murder was not connected to the other three and that she was killed by someone else, scientists could soon prove that this was not the case because they discovered the same red carpet fibers on her clothing. And alongside this, they also found a brown pubic hair on her clothing, which when tested was found to have come from a Caucasian male. So the red fibers confirmed that Chanel was another victim of this serial killer. And I think it was clear to the detectives at this point that catching this guy was going to be very difficult, more difficult than they thought it would be because he was obviously very clever. He knew that switching up his methods of killing and switching up how he left the victims would throw the police off his scent. He knew that it would confuse them and make them think that maybe there was more than one killer roaming the streets. However, little did he know that the police had connected the murders through the red carpet fibres, so they knew that they were looking for a serial killer. And soon this killer's victim count became five when just one week after the discovery of Chanel's body, another body was found. On the 14th of October, another young female was found dead near a lake in the northeast area of Tampa. Unlike the other victims, this body was actually wrapped up. She had been wrapped in a bedspread that was gold in colour and this bedspread had been tied around her with a blue coloured jogging suit I think. I'm not actually sure if this victim was naked inside the bedspread but she had been raped by her attacker and her hands and her feet had been tied together using rope so that she couldn't move and her cause of death was from strangulation. However in addition to that she had also been hit in the head very hard with a lot of force. After taking her fingerprints, the police were able to confirm that this was a woman called Karen Disfriend. She was 28 years old and she was originally from St. Petersburg. And according to sources, Karen had a good life. She came from a good wealthy family and she was very smart. But in her teenage years, she developed an addiction to drugs and she turned to sex work to fund this. And of course, the detectives were soon able to link her murder to the other four murders because red carpet fibres were collected from her body. In fact, one of the detectives said that when they went to the scene, he could actually see the red fibres on her. With the other victims, the scientists found and picked up the fibres, but this time, as I said, the detective could literally see the red fibres on Karen's body. I suppose it was easier because they knew exactly what they were looking for by this point. At the end of October 1984, about a fortnight after to Karen's murder, yet another victim was found when a contractor was digging a ditch and he discovered a human body and he immediately contacted the police. And this body was very badly decomposed when it was found. It had clearly been there for quite some time, about a month according to the medical examiner. For four weeks, this body 
was outside exposed to the elements and animals and it was decomposing quickly so the detectives knew that this victim was probably going to be the most difficult to identify yet and I'm not actually sure if they were ever able to determine what her cause of death was because of how badly decomposed her remains were. I don't know if the medical examiner was able to tell during the autopsy but she was found naked which obviously suggested a sexual motive to the crime and so the police were certain that this was another victim of the Tampa serial killer but they were still no closer to finding him, no closer at all really which was so so worrying because this latest victim was number six. Six women had been murdered by this man now and the police still had no idea who he was and of course it wasn't long before he attacked another woman however this time was different because this victim actually managed to escape with her life. It was the early hours of the morning on the 3rd of November 1984 so just a couple of days after the sixth body was found when a 17 year old girl named Lisa McVeigh was cycling home from work. You see Lisa worked at a Krispy Kreme donut shop in northern Tampa and she was obviously working a late shift that day and when she finished her shift at 2am she got on her bicycle and she started cycling home. However during the journey a man approached Lisa and he grabbed her. He pulled her off of her bike and he held a gun to her head and Lisa was begging for her life at this point. She said, please, whatever you do, don't kill me. But the man just told her to shut up and keep her eyes closed. And he dragged her to his car and pushed her into the vehicle. Once she was inside, he used some rope to tie her hands and her feet together. And then he covered her eyes with a blindfold. He then said to Lisa that if she did what he said and quote, showed him a good time tonight, he wouldn't kill her. He then sexually assaulted Lisa in the car by forcing her to perform oral sex on him and after this the man got into the driver's seat and he began driving along the highway. Lisa said that they were driving for about 10-15 minutes and although she had something covering her eyes she could just about see from underneath her blindfold and she saw on his car's dashboard the word Magnum. Eventually the man stopped the car and he pulled Lisa out of the vehicle and walked her into his apartment. When they got into his apartment the man took the blindfold off of Lisa and he ordered her to remove all of her clothes whilst he had the gun pointed right at her. And oddly enough he then took Lisa to the shower and forced her to have a shower right in front of him. After the shower he put the blindfold back on Lisa, he tied her back up he tied up her hands and then he put her in his bed and there he raped Lisa repeatedly. He raped her for hours and hours that night and Lisa says that she actually lost count of the amount of times that he raped her and what's heartbreaking is that this wasn't even a new thing to Lisa. She had had a very very traumatic childhood during which she was raped constantly by her grandmother's boyfriend over a period period of four years. She had been horrifically abused before and so she knew all too well what these kinds of men were like and she knew how to kind of read them and so she decided that while she was being held captive by this man in his apartment she was going to try her absolute hardest not to resist him because she was scared that if she resisted him and she tried to fight him back he would kill her and Lisa was also very very smart in this situation she knew that she needed to leave her DNA everywhere in the apartment just in case she didn't survive this so she was literally touching everything. She was touching his lamps, his tables, his hairdryer, his curtains, every single surface or object that she could so that her fingerprints would be left on them. And she also took I think a hair clip out of her hair and she dropped it underneath his bed. She knew that there was a very high chance that she would not make it out alive, that she would be murdered. And if that was going to happen, she wanted to help the police 
interest in catching her killer as much as she possibly could. As I said, this horrific ordeal that Lisa went through continued for hours and hours. The man raped her constantly. But he also just hit her and beat her. And Lisa said that his mood would change quite a lot. Sometimes he would be a little nicer to Lisa and then all of a sudden he would just switch and he would become so so angry and at one point Lisa actually asked him why he was doing this to her and he said that he had gone through a bad breakup and that he was sick of being hurt by women so he wanted to get revenge on them. Over 24 hours after Lisa was abducted her attacker I think ordered her to have another shower. He then gave her some clothes to put on and he made her a sandwich and then after this he said that he was going to take her home. He was going to let her go. So he put the blindfold back over Lisa's eyes. He took her to his car and they started driving away from his apartment. It was the middle of the night on the 4th of November, around like 3 a.m. At one point during the journey, the man pulled the car over and he told Lisa that he just needed to stop for a minute to get some cash out of an ATM machine because he needed to get some petrol for his car. And again, even though Lisa's eyes were mostly covered, she could still see a little bit from under her blindfold. So whilst he went to get some cash, she was just looking around trying to memorize as much as she could. She was trying to memorize road signs and the inside of his car. She took note of the color of the vehicle he was driving which was red and once again she saw the word Magnum on his dashboard. Anyway the man eventually got back in the car after getting his cash and he carried on driving towards Lisa's neighborhood. When he got there he stopped the car again. He pulled Lisa Lisa out and he actually hugged her and apologized. He said that he was sorry that he had to do this to her and then he got back in his vehicle and he drove away. As soon as he left, Lisa took the blindfold off of her face and she went home and then later she went to the police station and she told them what had happened to her and she told them everything that she could remember, every single detail that she had memorized like what his apartment was like, what she saw of it anyway when she wasn't blindfolded. She told them about how he had stopped at an ATM machine on the way home around 3am and she gave them a description of what he looked like. She said that he was a white male probably in his mid-30s. He was of average build, he was a very clean cut kind of person so he had quite a neat appearance. She said that he had a small bushy moustache, he had short hair, small ears and thin eyebrows and after she gave her account the police took Lisa's clothing and they sent it off to scientists so that they could conduct some tests. Now I think it's pretty clear that the guy who abducted and raped Lisa was the killer that the police had been looking for. He was the one responsible for those six murders. However, at this time when Lisa reported what had happened to her, the police didn't actually make that connection. They neglected to link Lisa's attack to the six murders and within the next eight days, two more bodies would be found. The first was found about a week after the last on the 6th of November 1984. It was discovered in Pasco County, actually on the same road as where Chanel Williams, the fourth victim, was dumped, but this victim was more towards the north. Again, it was clear that this body had been there for some time as it was pretty decomposed when it was found. It was mainly just skeletal remains, so I don't think they could tell exactly how she had died. However, the police were certain that this woman was another victim of the serial killer because she had been bound with rope and she had a ligature around her neck. And of course, the red carpet fibres were present on her remains. Actually, I think they only found one fibre, one single tiny fibre in her hair, but it was enough to tie her to the other murders. Also found at the scene was the woman's clothing. They recovered her 
gloves, her underwear and some jewellery that she owned. And unfortunately, like some of the previous victims, it did take a while for this woman to be identified because of how decomposed her body was. But eventually she was given her name back. This was 18 year old Virginia Johnson. Virginia was also called Ginny by her friends and family and she lived in both Florida and also Connecticut. I think she would travel between them both fairly often which is a hell of a long way to go. But yeah she kind of lived in both places. Sometimes she would stay in Florida for a little while and then she would go back to Connecticut and in both states she worked as a sex worker and obviously at the time of her death she was in Florida working as a sex worker. Apparently she disappeared about three weeks before her body was found when she went out to buy some cigarettes and she just never returned, no one saw her after that. And then just four days after Virginia's body was found on the 12th of November an eighth victim was discovered. This this time the killer had left the body in an area called North Orient Road in Tampa. She was lying face down on the ground and she was naked apart from she was wearing some knee high stocking. And the rest of her clothing which was some blue jeans and a top were found close to her body. And on the blue jeans the police found red carpet fibres. Her face was completely covered in blood where she had been horrifically beaten and she also had ligature marks on her wrists and on her neck. However, there wasn't actually any rope on her body when she was found, so the killer had obviously removed it before he left her there. It didn't take long for the victim to be identified this time because her driving license was in the pocket of her blue jeans. Victim number eight was 21-year-old student Kim Swan, who alongside her studies also worked as an exotic dancer. And the last time Kim was seen alive, was just the day before her body was found when she was leaving a shop near her parents home. Near where Kim's body was dumped near the crime scene the police actually found some tyre impressions in the grass and these tyre impressions matched the tyre tracks cast that was taken from the first murder scene. So alongside the red fibres that was another piece of evidence linking Kim's murder to the other cases and it was not not long after Kim's murder that the police finally connected these attacks, these eight murders, to the abduction, rape and torture of 17 year old Lisa McVeigh. Basically, as I said earlier, after Lisa was set free by her attacker, she went straight to the police and she told them what had happened to her. And as part of their inquiry into her abduction, they sent her clothes to scientists, to FBI scientists, in Washington. They were hopeful that they might be able to find evidence on her clothing that could identify her rapist and they did find something and this something didn't lead them directly to the man but it did lead them to the unidentified Florida serial killer because on Lisa's clothing they found red trilobal carpet fibres that were an exact match to the red carpet fibres that had been found on each of the eight murder victims. So they knew for certain now that Lisa was kidnapped by the same person that killed those women. Lisa McVeigh had literally escaped a serial killer. So now that the police investigating the murders had made the link, they went through Lisa's whole account of that night, going over every single thing that she could remember about the attack. And because of Lisa, they now knew so, so much more about this man than they did before. They now had a description of what he looked like and what he what he was just like as a person. They knew what kind of car they needed to look out for, a red one with the word Magnum on the dashboard. Lisa had provided the leads that the police had been waiting for. They now had leads that they could really investigate and hopefully soon they would catch their guy because of her. Now if you remember, one of the things that Lisa told the police about the night that her attacker let her go was that on the way back to her neighbourhood whilst they were in his car and he was taking 
taking Lisa home, the man actually pulled over and he stopped to get some cash out of an ATM machine at around 3 a.m. that morning. And so with this information, the police decided to go to all of the banks in the area and they asked if they could have a look through their records to see if they could trace the cards that have been used at the ATM machines around that time. Because obviously not many people are going to be getting cash out at 3 a.m. in the morning, but the killer did. So hopefully through the bank records, they would be able to track him down. And whilst they were waiting for the records, the police also did a bit more digging into the red car that Lisa said the man drove. And what they found out was that the only cars that had the word Magnum on it or in it was a 1978 Dodge Magnum car. So now the police knew what exact car the killer drove and they were another step closer to catching him. Although when they actually looked into how many people owned this car in the county, they discovered that it was a pretty high number. A lot of people had this vehicle. I believe about 500 people in total. So it was clearly a very popular vehicle at the time. So whilst this was still a very good lead, this alone didn't narrow down the suspect list too much because many people drove this car and the killer could have been any one of them. But what did narrow down the suspect list was the results of the ATM records from the banks in the area. When they looked at the records from one of the ATMs in the area, they discovered that a man named Robert Jones Long had used it at around 3 a.m. The same time that Lisa said her attacker stopped to get some cash out. And what was very interesting about Robert Joe Long was that he was also on the Magnum Dodge car list. He was one of the many people that owned a Magnum car. So because Robert Joe Long's name was on both lists, both the Magnum car list and the ATM list, he became a very big suspect in this case. And what was even more interesting about Robert Joe Long was that earlier that same day, the day that the detectives noticed his name on both lists, other police officers actually had an encounter with Long on Nebraska Avenue, the red light district in Tampa, where the eight murdered women either disappeared from or were known to have frequented. Basically, as expected, because the police knew that the killer owned a 1978 Dodge Magnum car, officers had been stopping every single one of these cars that they saw. And that day, officers happened to see one on Nebraska Avenue. And so they pulled the car over and they discovered discovered that the person driving it was Robert Joe Long. And when they pulled Robert over, they were quite stunned because they realised that he matched the description of the killer, the description that Lisa McVeigh gave. He was a white male in his 30s. Robert was 31, I believe, at this time. He had quite a neat appearance. He had a small moustache, short hair. He looked exactly like what the police imagined the killer would look like from Lisa's description. Now, when the officers pulled Robert's car over, they actually told him that they were looking for a robbery suspect. They didn't tell him that they were looking for a serial killer because because obviously if Robert was the killer, then that might make him panic and he might try to flee. So they just said that they were looking for someone involved in a robbery and they asked him if they could take his picture just so that they could check that he wasn't the guy they were looking for, the robber. And they noticed that Robert seemed a little bit nervous at this point, but he said yes anyway, he let them take his picture. And from what I can gather, they also asked him if they could just have a quick search of his car but he said no and they couldn't force him to let them look because obviously they didn't have a search warrant or anything at this point and so after they took his picture they had to let him go. However because they were so suspicious of him the officers that pulled him over actually got in contact with the task force headquarters so the detectives that were leading the serial killer inquiry and they said to them look we are really suspicious of this guy we just 
just pulled him over on Nebraska Avenue and he looks exactly like how Lisa described. We think he might be the guy. And the detectives agreed and decided that they needed to keep an eye on him. And so they put Robert Joe Long under 24 hour surveillance. And in the meantime, they also went to go and speak with Lisa McVeigh and they took her the picture that the officers had taken of Robert to see if she recognized him. They actually showed Lisa the picture of Robert in a photo lineup. So they showed her a couple of pictures of other men that also resembled the description that she gave of her attacker. And they showed her the one of Robert because they wanted to see if she would pick his photo out. And she did. As soon as she was shown all of the pictures, she immediately pointed to Robert's and she said that that was the man that abducted and raped her. So the detectives were certain now more than ever that they had found their guy. Finally, they had identified the serial killer that had been stalking the streets and murdering women for months and they began getting ready to arrest him. When they had the arrest warrant, the police followed Bobby Joe Long to a movie theater. He was going to watch a film and he was on his own. So a few undercover police officers followed him in there and they were watching him watch the film whilst other officers were just outside of the theatre and they were waiting for the film to end and for Long to come back out. And whilst they were waiting the officers decided to take a closer look at Bobby Joe's car. Obviously they couldn't look inside of it because it would have been locked but they could take a look at his tyres. And when they did they noticed that one of the tires just one of them was a Vogue tire which if you recall from earlier on that was the same type of tire that the FBI believed had made the tire impressions and tire tracks at a couple of the crime scenes so this was just even more evidence for the detectives not only did this man Bobby Joe Long have the exact same car as the killer he also had the same tire that made the tire tire tracks. When the film ended, Bobby Joe Long walked out of the movie theatre and as soon as he did, he was literally tackled to the ground by the police and he was arrested. He was arrested on the 16th of November 1984. He was taken to the police station after he was apprehended and at the same time his car was taken to a garage and a piece of the vehicle's red carpet was cut out and it was sent to to an FBI fibre expert. He was going to obviously compare it to the red carpet fibres that were found on the victim's bodies to see if it was a match. And of course it was. The carpet in his car was an exact match to the red carpet fibres that were obtained from every single victim. So this was concrete evidence that Bobby Joe Long was the serial killer that the police had been looking for for months now. But before we talk any more about the case and what happened after Bobby's arrest, let me just give you some background information about Bobby Joe Long, about his life leading up to this point. So Robert Joe Long, he was born on the 14th of October 1953 in Canova, which is a city in Wayne County, West Virginia in the US. His parents were called Joe and Luetta Long, however they were not together for very long. When Bobby was just two years old, they separated. Following the separation, Luetta took custody of their son and she went with him to Florida. They went to live there in Miami, which was pretty difficult for the two of them because Luetta was obviously now a single mother raising a young boy on her own. She worked in various different bars in Miami and she did really struggle financially to support her and her son. But you know, they made it work, they made it by and from what I could tell, they had a fairly good relationship Bobby Joe and his mother or at least they did in his younger years not so much as he started growing up we'll talk more about that in a second but speaking of his early years during his childhood Bobby Joe was very very accident prone he was constantly
constantly injuring himself some way or another. And a lot of these accidents that Bobby had actually involved his head. He sustained a lot of head injuries throughout his childhood, many of which resulted in him falling unconscious for short periods of time. One time he fell off of a swing and hit his head. He fell um, down the stairs. On another occasion, he fell off of a horse. And when he was just seven years old, he was actually hit by a car. And this accident in particular left him with a deformed jaw and badly damaged teeth, which he was very, very self-conscious about and badly bullied for by other children until he had an operation to fix it. But another thing that Bobby Joe was very self-conscious about was the fact that he was actually born with a condition called Kleinfelter syndrome. Kleinfelter syndrome is where baby boys are born with an extra X chromosome. Now usually baby girls are born with two X chromosomes and baby boys are born with one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. However about one in every 660 baby boys are born with an extra X chromosome. So instead of XY they have XXY and this is what's known as Kleinfelter syndrome. The symptoms of which can include teenage boys having higher levels of the hormone estrogen um, and higher levels of this hormone can result in teenage boys developing larger breasts when they go through puberty and this is exactly what happened to Bobby Joe. He started developing breasts and he was so so embarrassed about this and so when he was 13 13 years old he actually had surgery to remove his breasts however the scars that this surgery left him with also made him feel very embarrassed and very self-conscious and in addition to this as well as going through this when Bobby Joe started entering his teenage years his relationship with his mother really started to go downhill as I said before they really struggled for money because Luetta was a single parent and so because of that they had to live in a tiny tiny one bed apartment in Florida and because it was only one bed Bobby had to share a bed with his mother and he had to share a bed with her right up until his teenage years. When he was like 12, 13 he was still sleeping in the same bed as his mum and he really started to resent his mother around this time because she started like bringing home different men that she would meet at the bars that she worked at. She would bring them home and she would wake Bobby Joe up and make him go and sleep on the sofa while she spent the night with these men in the bedroom. And it's actually believed that Long's anger towards women and his hatred for women and desire to hurt them stemmed from this, stemmed from his own mother. He really hated the fact that his mother wasn't like other mums. She wasn't a typical like 1950s housewife that would stay at home all the time cooking and cleaning and obeying their husband and looking after the children. He felt like she didn't look after him very well and he started viewing his own mother as a whore essentially. I hate using that terminology but that is how he saw her because she worked in a bar and she would sleep with a few of the men that she met there and he really held a grudge against his mother for this and I think he despised other women that he felt were similar to his mother such as sex workers and it's believed that's why he targeted them specifically during his killing spree because he hated them. But anyway fast forward to the year 1974 when Bobby Joe would have been around 21 years old he actually got married he married a girl named Cindy and the two Bobby Joe and Cindy had known each other for a number of years by this point they met when they were both in high school and they were really good friends they loved spending time together they would go fishing they would go to the movie theater they would go scuba diving together they got along really well and eventually they began dating when Bobby Joe left school he went on to get a job as as an electrical assistant, an electrician's assistant. However, he didn't stay in that job for too long before joining the army at age 19. And then, as I said, a couple of years later, on the 25th of January 1974, he married Cindy. And they were really, really happy together to begin with. Cindy even said that being married to Bobby felt like a fairy tale. And she believed 
believed that they were going to be together forever. They were going to grow old together. However, as time went on, this fairy tale marriage turned into a nightmare for Cindy because Bobby Joe started getting very abusive. He was quick to anger, he had a very short temper and he was also just a very jealous man. In fact, if Cindy even just spoke to another man, had a conversation with another man, Bobby Joe would lose it and he would accuse Cindy of being unfaithful and cheating on him, which she hadn't. He was just incredibly possessive of Cindy. He saw her as his property and he felt like he was entitled to order her around and control her. It's kind of like what we were talking about before. He believed women should follow certain rules and I think he wanted Cindy to be a typical 1950s house wife that he could boss around. Like I said, he was very controlling over Cindy, even to the point of like telling her what she could and couldn't eat. She could not eat certain foods if he didn't like them or if he didn't like the smell of them. And this controlling behaviour got so bad that Cindy said she just felt like she was Bobby Joe's puppet on a string. Just a couple of months after the young couple tied the knot, in March of 1974, Bobby Joe Long had yet another accident where he sustained yet another head injury. Basically he was involved in a motorcycle accident, apparently he was riding on his motorbike and he was hit by another vehicle and he hit his head. And after this accident Bobby Joe Long changed completely. He was now quicker to anger than ever before. Before the accident the abuse that Cindy suffered at the hands of her husband was I think more like mental abuse and emotional abuse because he was so controlling. But after the accident, he started getting very, very violent towards her and he demanded sex from Cindy constantly. In the years that followed, Cindy and Bobby Joe had two children together. They had a son and a daughter and Cindy said that despite everything, Bobby Joe was actually a very good father. He was a strict parent, but he was also very caring. He loved spending time with his kids and he was never violent or aggressive towards them. It was just with his wife, Cindy. He treated her awfully. And Bobby Joe was incredibly manipulative with Cindy. If he hit her or he beat her, he would always manage to convince her that it was her fault. She provoked him, she made him lose his temper and if she hadn't done that, he wouldn't need to get violent. Shortly after the birth of their second child, Cindy noticed that her husband Bobby Joe just suddenly started going out very late at night, which was something that he had never really done before, but now he was doing it constantly. And when Cindy asked him why he was doing this, what was he doing, where was he going, he just told her that he needed to get away from her and the kids for a bit, he needed some space. But as I'm sure you've probably guessed, that wasn't what he was doing at all. He was actually going out and looking for women that he could rape. After his motorbike accident, Bobby seemed to develop some very sadistic sexual fantasies and he fantasized about assaulting women and raping women and so he would go out late at night and start making his fantasies a reality. He also developed a sort of tactic when it came to his rapes. You see, Bobby Joe would go through um, like local newspapers and he would have a look through the classified ads section and he would circle all of the ads where someone was advertising like a piece of furniture or something just in their home. He would contact the person selling the item, whatever item it was, he would then go to their house and if he discovered that the person that answered the door was a woman who was home alone, he would go into the home and attack and rape her and then he would just leave. And these string of rapes earned him the nickname, the classified ad rapist and it's believed that he raped at least 50 women. But 
he wouldn't actually be identified as the classified ad rapist until later on in his life when he was arrested for the murders. Meanwhile, as all of these rapes were happening, the abuse that Cindy suffered at the hands of her husband just got worse and worse and worse. And in 1980, six years into their marriage, Cindy actually had to go to hospital for treatment because Bobby Joe beat her so badly. And the staff at the hospital actually contacted the police and said to them, look, we think this woman is being abused by her husband. She says that she isn't, but we strongly believe that she is. And so the police got involved and they spoke to Cindy, but she lied to them too. She just made up some excuses for how she had gotten injured. She never wanted to implicate her husband, I imagine because she was terrified of him and she was scared of what he might do to her if she did tell the truth about what he was really like. However, when she eventually came home from the hospital, Cindy was just like, enough is enough. She knew that she couldn't take this anymore. She couldn't keep being her husband's punching bag. And so she got home and she loaded a shotgun that they owned and she pointed it at her husband's head whilst he was sleeping. And she was trying to bring herself to pull the trigger. And when Bobby Joe woke up and he saw what was happening, that his wife was pointing a gun at him, he actually said to her, quote, go ahead, bitch, you don't have the nerve. And Cindy replied to him saying, actually, I do, I do have the nerve, but my children are more important to me than you will ever be. They're worth more to me than you will ever be. And I'm not going to do this to them. So she put the gun down and she said to Bobby Joe, I'm filing for a divorce. And Cindy actually says now, when she found out about the murders that Bobby Joe committed, she says that she regrets putting the gun down. She wishes she had shot and killed her husband that day. Because if she had, then he wouldn't have been able to do what he went on to do. And many lives would have been saved from this monster. After the couple divorced, Bobby Joe moved on his own to Tampa Bay in Florida, where as we know, he began his murder spree just a couple of years later in 1984. And that brings us back to where we were before in the case. So as we know, Bobby Joe was arrested on the 16th of November 1984 outside of a movie theatre. He was taken to the police station for questioning and his car was also seized. And when the carpet from his car was sent off to the crime lab for testing, it was found to be an exact match to the red carpet fibers that were found on all eight murder victims. So this was confirmation that he was the serial killer that the police had been looking for. Now during Bobby Joe's questioning at the police station, he actually straight away confessed to the abduction and rape of Lisa McVeigh. He didn't try to deny that at all. He admitted that that was him. However, when the police started asking him questions about the murders, he did deny those. He said that he had nothing to do with any of them. But of course the police knew that he was lying because they had a lot of evidence by this point linking him to the crime. They had the evidence from Lisa McVeigh, they had the tyre track evidence, they knew that his Vogue tyre was the one that made the tyre tracks at the crime scene. And on top of that they had the red carpet fibre evidence linking him to the cases. So they knew that he was the murderer and so they confronted Bobby Joe with all of the evidence that they had obtained and as soon as they did Bobby clearly realized that the game was up. There was no point in denying it now with all of the evidence they had against him and so he confessed. He confessed to every single murder and admitted that he was a serial killer. Following his confession Bobby Joe talked the detectives through each and every murder where he abducted the women from, what he did to them, how he killed them and and the detective said that as he was describing these brutal and vicious murders, he was just so calm and collected. It was like he did not care. He was talking about these killings in 
the same sort of way that you would talk about the weather, like they meant nothing to him. He obviously didn't feel any guilt or remorse at all for what he had done and for how many lives he had destroyed. And when the detectives asked him why, why had he killed these women, he responded saying that that was his secret and he was going to take it to the grave. And it was towards the end of his interview with the detectives that Bobby Joe Long made another shocking confession he admitted to another murder a murder that the police didn't even know about yet so far Bobby Joe had been linked to eight killings but he said that there was a ninth victim and he told them where they could find the body so the police went to the location where he said he left the body I believe it was in Hillsborough County and there they found human remains and this body was very bad badly decomposed by the time it was found. I believe it was actually just skeletal remains and so they had to use um, dental records to identify her. And eventually she was identified as Vicky Elliott. She was 21 years old and she worked as a waitress. It was also around this time that Long helped the police identify the sixth murder victim. If you remember from earlier, the police were really, really struggling to identify her because her body was also very badly decomposed. Compose. However, eventually they were able to give this Jane Doe her name back. She was 22-year-old Kimberly Hobbs, who just like other victims, worked as a sex worker and was last seen by her boyfriend when she got into a car one night that matched the description of Bobby Joe Long's vehicle. So now that was nine women, nine murders linked to Long. However, it didn't stop there. Just six days after he he was arrested, another set of remains were found when a couple that were out walking found a human skull, a couple of other bones, some rope and also some women's clothing. So again, very, very decomposed upon discovery. However, these remains were eventually found to have been a young woman named Artisan Wick. She was just 18 years old when she was killed and she was actually engaged. However, her marriage would never go ahead because one day she just suddenly disappeared from a street corner in northeast Tampa. As soon as she went missing, her friends and family reported Artisan as missing. However, it would be months until they discovered the horrifying truth about what had happened to her. She was murdered by Bobby Joe Long and he confessed to this. When he was confronted with evidence of a 10th victim, he confessed to that murder too. Well, I say 10th victim, but it actually turns out that Artisan was in fact Long's first victim. She was killed in March of 1984, so she was the first woman to be murdered by Long but the last to be found. Her body wasn't found until late 1984, about eight months after her death. The year after the killings, in 1985, Long was convicted of nine murders in total, as well as several other charges, including kidnap, sexual battery, and the abduction and sexual battery of 17-year-old Lisa McVeigh, the one who survived the attack during his killing spree. I believe the only murder he wasn't convicted of was the murder of Artisan Wick, the last victim that was found, and I'm not entirely sure why. I've read on a couple of sources that it was because he had already been charged with the nine murders before Artisan's body was found. I also read on one source that when it came to his court proceedings, his confessions to the murders were thrown out so they couldn't be used as evidence. So perhaps the police just didn't have enough evidence to concretely say that he was responsible for Artisan's murder too. I'm not too sure what happened there, but anyway, for his other charges, he received some hefty sentences. He was given one five-year sentence, four 99-year sentences, 28 life sentences, and a death sentence. He was sentenced to death for what he did. Bobby Joe tried to appeal his sentences a number of times over the years, I believe, but of course, these appeals were not successful and he sat on death row for about 34 years until 2019. So just a couple of years ago when a Florida governor signed his death warrant. And on the 23rd of May 2019, six 
65-year-old Robert Joe Long was put to death by lethal injection. He was pronounced dead at 6.55 p.m. And that is it for this case. That is the story of the serial killer Robert Joe Long. In total, he had 10 victims, 11 including Lisa McVeigh. And as I said earlier on, it's believed that he committed at least 50 rapes in the 1970s and early 1980s. Although a lot of people believe that he had way more victims than that. He was linked to 10 murders, but it is strongly believed that he killed even more women. And either he has just never been connected to their cases or their bodies have never been found to this day. But what do you guys think? Do you think he had more victims or do you think it was just those 10? I definitely think that he murdered more than that and he was clearly a killer that would have just carried on and carried on with killing people had he never been caught. But yeah, that is it for this case. As always, please do let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comments. Before I go, I just want to say thank you to Babbel once again for sponsoring this video. Remember, if you go through the link in my description box, you can receive up to 65% off your Babbel subscription. Less than $5 a month to learn a new language. Thank you guys so, so much for watching. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye guys.